medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. Daily new cases in the United States seems to be slowly decreasing if we look at the seven-day moving average. And the daily new deaths in the United States also seems to be slowly decreasing, especially if we look at the seven-day moving average, although it seems to have flattened and then decreased slightly. If we look at the current toolbox that we have for COVID-19, we've got arguably four items amongst many others. Remember that remdesivir was given emergency use authorization from the FDA based on a study that showed that the time to recovery was reduced in that randomized controlled trial. It did not show a mortality benefit. But many people believe that if the study was taken out to its conclusion, in other words, if 1,000 people, as was planned, was enrolled in the study, that that would have met statistical significance. Nevertheless, it didn't happen. There's been some news regarding that in that it's been broadened in its scope. More news on that later in this update. The second one was dexamethasone, and they used it for about 10 days in the study. This came out of the recovery trial in Great Britain. And in this case, there actually was a survival benefit. And in this case, it was six milligrams, either orally or intravenously in these patients. Now, I've been at the bedside taking care of these patients on a regular basis. And there's a number of these patients that get better very quickly and are able to go home after about four or five days or even a week. And we found that these patients who would benefit from dexamethasone are the patients that are on oxygen, very similar to the initial type of patients that were requiring remdesivir. So for remdesivir, we would give these patients remdesivir if they were requiring supplemental oxygen. Same thing in the recovery trial regarding dexamethasone. So these patients would come in, they would require oxygen, we would start them on dexamethasone, and we would give it for 10 days. Why? Because that's exactly the length of time that they used in the recovery trial. But there were some patients that didn't get better. In fact, there's just a lot of patients that stick around in the intensive care unit for days, even weeks, if you can believe it. Those of you out there that are listening to me that take care of COVID-19 patients know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a subset of patients. They get bad, they get worse, they get on the ventilator, and they stay there for, in some cases, weeks. Well, one of the things that I've noticed is that when we start these patients on 10 days of dexamethasone, there is an improvement in not only the clinical scenario, but also in a number of the blood tests that we check. So what are those things that we check? One of those things that we check is a CRP. CRP stands for C-reactive protein, and it is a marker of inflammation going on in the body. And typically, we see that these CRP levels are very elevated initially. And then when we start them on dexamethasone, then they start to come down, showing a response. We see a very similar picture for patients with ferritin. Now, I know that ferritin has iron as opposed to CRP. And some people may think that that ferritin may actually work into the pathophysiology. I know there was some argument about that a few months ago, that iron seemed to be the reason why patients were getting sick. No, in fact, ferritin is also an acute phase protein, and it's going to go up if there is inflammation going on. And again, typically these patients have high ferritin levels, and when you start them on Decadron, it goes down. Number three is the LDH. This is also seen. We see LDH, which is an intracellular enzyme, and when cells are being broken down and there's inflammation, we see LDH increase as well. Another one that we keep track of in these patients is a D-dimer. Now, D-dimers are little pieces of protein that is usually the byproduct of coagulation. And so this is a very rough way of determining if there is coagulation occurring in the human body. And so we would typically see these levels up because we know that there is an increased risk of thrombosis in COVID-19 patients. But we don't yet know whether or not this is the be-all and end-all of coagulation. In other words, some groups have put forward some evidence that would seem to indicate that the D-dimer isn't capturing everything. That may be the case, but nevertheless, in all of these situations, we see a pattern of high CRP, high ferritin, high LDH, and elevated D-dimer in these patients. 
And I'm sure you could add other factors in here as well. But in those patients where we're checking these on a daily basis, we can track their inflammatory pattern. And when these patients get put on dexamethasone, which is a corticosteroid, we see that these numbers go down. They respond to the Decadron. The problem is, is that these patients, these subset of patients that end up in the hospital for days, even weeks, at some point when we put this order in for dexamethasone to go for 10 days, what I've noticed anecdotally in a number of patients is that at the 10th day, the dexamethasone stops. And because dexamethasone has a fairly long half-life, it's not tapered off because when you stop the medication, it eventually wears off after a couple of days. If you look back at the recovery trial, they specifically didn't taper the dexamethasone. But what I've invariably noticed in the patients that I've taken care of is that these markers start to go back up again. And it's not just numbers. It's not just we're looking at the LDH and the D-dimer. I'm also starting to see clinical evidence of deterioration after about 10 days and then stopping the dexamethasone and seeing these factors go back up again. What I'll also see as evidence of that is that the FiO2, which is the amount of oxygen that we have to give these patients, also starts to go up. And I've seen these anecdotally in a number of patients to the point where I've made a mental note of that. And I'm very careful now at the end of 10 days to determine, is this patient going to benefit from stopping? I stop it and I watch very carefully, specifically looking at these numbers. Again, this is anecdotal evidence. I don't know whether or not there's a subsection of patients that may do better with a longer course, but I think it needs to be looked into. And this also brings up a wider point, which is, yeah, we know what medications in our toolbox are helpful against COVID-19, but the real science and the real art of taking care of patients in the intensive care unit is paying attention to detail, looking at all of those regular things that we look at in every patient who's in the intensive care unit. We look at their sodium concentration. We look at their potassium concentration. We look at their acid-base status something that we call a CHEM-7. It looks like a little kind of a fishbone type of structure on a paper where we look at their sodium, their potassium, their chloride, their bicarbonate concentration, which is listed as CO2. We look at their BUN and we look at their creatinine, basically their kidney function and their glucose. To give you an example, when a patient is on the ventilator with COVID-19, they're breathing rapidly. In some cases, we have the ventilator set to 20 or 30 breaths per minute. And because of that, they're breathing out a lot of moisture. Well, that's a lot of free water loss. And so if you don't replace that, you're not careful. The total body concentration of just about everything, including the sodium, will start to rise. And you'll see this imperceptibly on a daily basis that if this patient is being dehydrated and not being replaced with free water, you'll start to see a sodium concentration which is normally around 140 to 145, go as high as 150 or even higher. And so what you need to do is to be able to, first of all, pick this up and to be able to replace that free water. Otherwise, the patient's going to be very uncomfortable and you could start getting dehydration and worsening kidney function. And so because this diligent attention to detail in the intensive care unit is so important, We've put together a course on monitoring this CHEM7, and it's going to be premiering very shortly on our medcram.com platform. And this is intended for healthcare providers who are taking care of patients in the outpatient setting, in the inpatient setting, and in the intensive care unit. How fast should you correct sodium? What are the correct medications for bringing down potassium? What is the meaning of a low or high bicarbonate level? And what does it mean if there's an anion gap? What about the BUN? What happens if it's low? What happens if it's high? How does the liver affect that? What about creatinine? Are there medications that can increase the creatinine without actually changing the renal function? And then what do you do about glucose? What happens if it's low? How do you keep it from being too high? All of these things are important and get mixed in to the survival benefit in these patients with COVID-19. Because as we've just discussed, a lot of these patients hang around in the intensive care unit for days and even weeks. Moving on really quickly, we've talked about plasma. We do have data on plasma, but it's not placebo-controlled. It's not a controlled trial. And so more work still needs to be done on that. But there was also another emergency use authorization by the FDA to allow us to use plasma 
in COVID-19 patients. And so that has continued, and we are continuing to use plasma. And of course, testing. Now, we've talked about testing before. What about those paper tests? Okay, not for use in the hospital particularly, but especially now that schools are opening in some cases, and we want to be able to identify people with the disease specifically who can transmit it, who are infectious, who are contagious. And the sensitivity on those type of tests need not be at the level that we have currently for our diagnostic tests that are in the hospital. And I want to say look out for another interview that we're going to have with Dr. Michael Minna on this topic. Last time we talked to you about three patients that have been reinfected. And in most of these cases, in fact, in all three of these cases, the second infection was deemed to be more mild or even asymptomatic. In fact, in one of the cases, the patient only knew that he had the COVID-19 or coronavirus the second time because of a screening evaluation that he did when he flew back from Europe to Hong Kong. We now report a 25-year-old from Nevada. So this is the first American case that we have of this, where in mid-April, the patient came down with symptoms of headache, cough, sore throat, nausea, and diarrhea. But after about 10 days, his symptoms completely went away. Then, at the end of May, after testing negative times two to the virus, the patient developed these symptoms, headache, fever, and again, nausea, and diarrhea. The patient tested positive. So he tested positive here at the first case, then tested negative times two before testing positive again. And when they compared the genomes of these two positivities, they found that they were different. There was a number of differences in the RNA or the genomic material of these viruses. Both of them, however, were SARS-CoV-2. The difference, though, in this case was that the patient actually had to be hospitalized the second time and required oxygen, but not a ventilator. And here's the actual preprint. It has not been peer-reviewed as yet, but we will put the link in the description below, and here they have the abstract. And the full paper, you may have to sign up to the site to be able to read. Of course, it's unclear how generalizable these findings are, or whether this will affect the efficacy of vaccines, which we'll talk about later in this update. One of the things that we mentioned earlier in this update was the use of remdesivir in patients with COVID-19. Now, until August 28, 2020, remdesivir was indicated for the use of COVID-19 in patients who required supplemental oxygen, and they discouraged the use of remdesivir in patients with low renal function and also with patients with high liver function tests or elevated liver enzymes. On August 28th, however, they broadened that indication in a emergency use authorization for all hospitalized patients who are positive for SARS-CoV-2 and have COVID-19. So in other words, you don't have to be on supplemental oxygen. And this is the press release, and we'll put a link in the description below. Remember that remdesivir is an intravenous medication. And so it would be difficult to give this to patients in the outpatient setting unless something is done to change the vehicle in which it is administered. I also wanted to report that while Moderna and Pfizer have already initiated phase three trials of their vaccine, Tuesday will mark the third company, AstraZeneca, in combination with Oxford University in the UK, to start their phase three trials. And all three of those companies are looking for about 30,000 subjects to populate their phase three trials. And they're hoping to get some data out, at least from this Oxford COVID-19 vaccine by Thanksgiving. For those of you who don't know, Thanksgiving in the United States is around the end of November. 
And also to remind you about the Oxford study, what they're doing is they're taking an adenovirus vehicle and they are changing the genetics of that adenovirus so that it presents to the host, to the person getting the vaccine, the protein for the spike protein on the coronavirus itself so that antibodies are made against that spike protein. And just to remind you about this particular Oxford coronavirus vaccine, there was a story that was published in the Oxford Vaccine Group that showed on July 20th, 2020, that there was a strong response to this vaccine. And I'll quote here, the results of a phase one, two trial published today in the scientific journal, The Lancet, indicate no early safety concerns and it induces a strong immune response in both parts of the immune system. The vaccine provoked a T-cell response within 14 days of vaccination and also an antibody response within 28 days. And the chief investigator, Professor Andrew Pollard at the Oxford Vaccine Trial at Oxford University says, we saw the strongest immune response in the 10 participants who received two doses of the vaccine, indicating that this might be a good strategy for vaccination. And a little bit more about that phase three trial. They said here that Oxford and AstraZeneca are collaborating with clinical partners around the world as part of a global clinical program to trial the Oxford vaccine. The global program is made up of a phase three trial in the U.S. enrolling 30,000 patients, a pediatric study, as well as a phase three trial to low to middle income countries, including Brazil and South Africa, which are already underway. So this does look promising, and we'll have to see what those results will be later this year, and hopefully we'll have something to be thankful for at Thanksgiving. And I just wanted to add that neither I nor anybody else here at MedCram have any financial ties to Oxford or to AstraZeneca or for any other vaccine producer for that matter. What we do have an interest in is seeing this COVID-19 disease licked. And for that, we will keep working toward an ends. Don't forget to check out our medical-related lectures and courses at medcram.com. We also offer courses for medical schools, PA schools, respiratory therapy schools in a flipped classroom style, perfectly designed for the COVID-19 epidemic. If you are an institution interested in such courses, please contact us at medcram.com. Thanks for joining us.